very well. Okay. Good. So let's start. Hannah will let in anybody who's late. So today we are at week eight, almost done with the theory part. Today we talk about mesh and analysis. Just to remind you guys, next week we have double feature and also the week after that we have a double feature, which means that we're gonna be together for a little longer. I am gonna have two presentations of half an hour together and we're gonna start at 5.30 so that we can still have the time for questions either in between or at the end. It's gonna be a difficult topic. Massimo will be there to help me a little. Uh, so I'm just gonna go through all the specifics of all the things that are inputted in the analysis command and how let's say you should combine them for a different type of analysis. And what are anyway, uh, all the specific aspects of using a different algorithm or a solver, et cetera. So I know this stuff is really complicated, it is for me. And I hope everybody will be there because it's quite interesting. Maybe it's the most interesting part we've done since now. But anyway, today we have an introduction to that, like things you need to know before we get to that. Um, we talk about mesh, how to build the mesh, how to assign seeds and control specific inputs of the mesh and how to, of course, build it and apply it. And now we talk about the analysis setup in general. Um, it's just gonna talk about the default setup and maybe then we can just go off the script together and discuss what is it that we want to put like extra if we want to do different type of analysis, but we'll see if we have time. So, um, what about, about the mesh? I don't know if any of you guys have tried to do a model by yourself. First thing that happens is that if you don't mesh, the model doesn't run. So it's a very important thing to do before you run the model. And you can assign your mesh in different ways. There are three type of commands you can use, the global seed, the edge seed, and you can remove the seeds that you previously applied. What's important to remember is that if you assign a global seed, it will be assigned to the whole model. So maybe you can, just define like a seed uniform by division or by size. We can look at that afterwards in the in the in the software, but that will be assigned overall to everything you have in your model and will override everything else that you had assigned locally. Instead, the edge seed is something that you assign locally. So you just select a few edges or a few faces, and there that a seed will be applied there. What you see is that whenever you click on one of these um, commands. The visualization in the render view changes from here to showing you the seed that you have applied. This is because if you had not yet created a mesh in your model, there are no actual nodes of the mesh. So you will not be able to see anything. Okay. Then after that, whenever you have already created a mesh and the mesh is saved and like stored in your model, whenever you click on the mesh tab in the top, in the top view, let me show you directly, just maybe it's easier to Remember, like for example, in this model here from week three, if I click on the mesh tab, you see there's no mesh here. I cannot see anything. But if I click on global seed and I zoom in, I can see the nodes got like a highlighted in pink. It kind of overlaps with the interactions. But for example, if I assign a uniform by division of 10 uh, to globally to everything, it will be assigned here. And whenever I open here, I don't know why this is happening really weird. Wow. Let me try and build this mesh, see what happens. Okay, so here there must be a local seed already applied. So let's try to remove it and reassign a global one. I'm going to remove any local seed application and reapply a global seed application and build a new mesh. Perfect. Okay, so you just see again an example of when, uh, let's say, these commands kind of uh, intertwine with each other. So what happens is that whenever you apply a local seed um, and you try to override it with a global seed, that doesn't always work. So you have to remove the seed before you reapply a global seed that you wish or anyway, another edge seed that you wish. Maybe with very few lines and very few faces, it works just directly, but this is a larger model. So you need to actually remove what you defined beforehand before you reapply your edge controls and edge seed controls. Edge, uh, mesh controls are a different thing. We'll just, we're gonna get to it. So all nodes of the geometry become automatically a node of the mesh. I'm sure this is a very, very, let's say consolidated concept, but just for you, just to show you like, 
if this uh, is the first time I'm meshing this model, when I click on this global seed, all of the nodes will be already a node of the mesh, so it will be already highlighted in pink. The global default seed applied to all is one, of course. And then, as I said, these two override each other, but be careful, sometimes it doesn't work. And then remove seed works only for the selected phases. So as you saw me doing, when you remove a seed, you have to select before and what you want to what you want it to be removed from. Okay, so enough of the seeds. Let's go into the control. So whenever you have, um, let's say just edges, maybe you will not click on this bottom at all because you know that the default is linear and you just want a linear shape function to be applied to your um, uh, mesh order in, in the edges. So maybe you will not use, but when you have faces, it's very important that you use the mesh control. So you click on this button, you open the faces and you select most probably structured and quadrilateral elements. But I mean, this can vary, of course, from the type of model that you're doing. Anyway, you can define what's the algorithm with which your mesh will be built, the topology of your mesh. So the unit, the mesh unit of the single unit of your mesh, and then the order of um, of course the order we talked about before the linear quadratic or quadratic serendipity for example if you're using a uh, shell cool for model for, for elements you need a mesh that is structured and with quadrilateral elements to be able to use that kind of elements in your model this is because you need to ensure compatibility between the finite elements that you're choosing and the topology that you want to assign to it so there needs to be compatibility, otherwise STKO will yield a, an error saying um, that the mesh you're trying to apply requires more nodes than your element allows, or vice versa. At the end of all of this setup, you can build your mesh. So you can just click on build mesh and depending on the size of your model, sometimes it's gonna take a long time, sometimes just a few seconds, you will be able to build your mesh. So what you will see now in the mesh tab is the mesh geometry referencing your model, your, your geometry, let's say the one you modeled uh, with the CAD tools of STKO. Just for you to remember, the mesh built in STKO is not an orphan mesh. I cannot build my mesh and then modify it by like clicking into an, on a node and drag it. This does not happen here. So the mesh is applied to the geometry and whenever you want to change it, you have to change the geometry itself. Uh, manual editing is not possible. When you modify the geometry, so maybe I don't know, you, uh, let's say you built your mesh here, but then you go in the geometry and you draw a line, whatever, okay? You will go in the mesh, the mesh is lost. So if you had taken a long time to build your mesh and then need to modify the geometry, but you don't want to lose it because maybe it was anyway quite good or mm, you're not sure of the modification you're doing, just save your model in a different file. It will store the mesh you created, but you need to save it before creating any of these operations, like before exploding anything, merging anything, creating new lines, etc. So anything that will impact the work tree in the geometry tab, that will change and erase the mesh. So going back here, what happens when you erase the mesh or rebuild the mesh, the partition is also lost. So what is the partition? The partition is actually a subdivision of your model uh, that is made automatically by STKO. It allows you most of the times to run parallel uh, analysis. So what we do is div divide your model in different parts, but the parts are intertwined with each other. So what the write TCO command will do at the end when you're going to run your analysis is write um, the nodes, the elements, the materials, and everything that uh, all the information that are stored in your model in different files so that they can be run on separate processors. This is really, really powerful, and it's something that is not available in OpenTIS by itself. You cannot partition your model just with an OpenTIS command. It's a built in tool of STKO that only we have. Um, so, just so you know, whenever you want to run your model with an open TCMP multiprocessor, you need to have a partition. And this goes also whenever you want to run your model with the MAMPS here, when you go in the analysis command, I can show you directly. If I want a system solver that is this one called MAMPS, of which we will 
talk about a lot uh, in the next two weeks. Just so you know that if you pick this, you need a partition. It can be only one, like you're not doing a parallel computer, you just want to use the system solver. So anyway, you need to partition your model at one. When you partition your model, you just define a number of partition that you desire. Let's say maybe this time 10. You click on partition and it will be created. Now it doesn't work. You know why? Because the mesh is not there. So if I create my mesh again, I can now only partition my model. There it is. So what's interesting now here is that you can actually go in the partition and read the number of the processor on which this part of your structure will be run. This can be useful if you're running parametric analysis and or you're running different models in the same file. You want to know which model will end up on which processor or which part of the structure will end up on which processor to apply specific commands to that part. You can read that there, identifying it by the colors or anyway, if you click on it, it will be selected if the colors are not so clear to be distinguished, like for example, this salmon and this pink. So whenever you remesh, you have to rebuild the partition. And just anyway, for the sake of explaining this very fast, if I erase my mesh and I try to run my analysis, this happened. So the geometry is not being meshed. This is the most basic and easiest to solve error in STKO. So just build your mesh and you will be fine. So always build your mesh before you hit run. And I think we're done for anything you need to know about meshing. Just write down if you have any more questions because we're not gonna talk about this anymore. So if you come up with some things that you, I don't know, you have been experiencing while running your model on meshing, we can talk about it today. Going forward, we're gonna talk about the analysis steps. So the part of the work tree at the end of it, where we already, done our geometries, define our interactions, define our definitions, physical properties, element properties, and condition. Everything else has to be done before we get to this step, okay? Of course, we can create things. It's not like it's not allowed, but model will not run if we don't. We, if you did not define all the things before, or you will not be able to select the specific things that you need to have already created in these commands. What we use to create the analysis steps are, of course, these operations. And we use a lot of these arrows here. Before, these arrows have no actual purpose, like just maybe for you to, to show uh, something before something else, or maybe to reference a property in. So another one has to be created before. But I mean, uh, that's kind of straightforward and not so bounding. But instead, in the analysis steps, the orders is really, really important. Um, it's not forced by the software, so you have to know by yourself. What you have to know is that you need to create first a recorder, the MPC recorder. Secondly, you have to uh, apply your constraint pattern and your load pattern. And at the end, you can also you can include your analysis command. So this is the order. Of course, there's a lot of other stuff that can go in between and after. There's so many different like um, setup and configurations that can come out from uh, different models, but this is the basics of everything, okay? So once you know about your generic setup, let's go inside each of these to understand more what's inside of them. Um, yeah, I, I've already stressed this enough, I think. So inside the, the MPC recorder, you have you can select the results that you want the OpenSea simulation to save. It's not like in OpenSea's tickle scripting that you have to select on which nodes you want to know your results or on which element. This will just save everything on everything that's modeled in your, in your entire structure. What changes is that, um, so what changes is that you can actually have results on everything without having to repeat the list of your indices or having to create a list of indices of your nodes and elements and then call it in the record command. You just click on one of these boxes and you'll have displacement results on all the nodes of your model. First, oh, sorry. First thing you need to know is of course to rename the recorder. Why? Because 
that will be the actual name that will be given to the MPCO file saved in your folder that you select when you run the analysis. And that's what you have to take back when you want to extract your results in the post processor. What I do most often is give my recorder a meaningful name that says something about the analysis I'm running, like gravity analysis, dynamic analysis, or I input some of the information of that specific analysis if I run many on the same model so that I can distinguish the MPC recorder. Just know that when you rerun the analysis, it will be over overwritten what you created before. So if you want to save a different results, you need to change the name of your recorder. What you can select here are nodal results. So results at the node and linear along the elements of the, fin of the along the finite elements or elemental results. So results on the Gauss points, except for local forces, which are results at the extremities of the elements. And of course, fiber results, which are results on the fibers. Um, you can also create custom element results when you click here in the software. Let me just show you. Oh, we are. If you click here, then you can just add and mm, input what element results you want to add. Then you can select the frequency at which you want the results to be recorded. So at every step of the analysis or with a specific interval, time interval, or at a specific number of steps. So every 10 steps or every 50 steps. This can be useful. I mean, most of the times, if you are running a model, you just want to see what happens at the end, like in terms of results. Maybe you want to build a pushover curve, but you're running with a specific accuracy that to, to be able to build the curve in a smooth way and not lose the convergence. But at the same time, you know that if you are going to print the curve with a, a smaller interval, you will be able to see it anyway in a good way. So this can be useful to let's say make your MPC or recorder five lighter, file lighter. And what you can define here is a region. We're going to talk about regions afterwards, but let's say regions are container of geometries. Like, let's say as if it's a list of indices or a list of uh, indices of nodes or of elements that you can input here. And the, this, let's say this result will be recorded only on those elements. So unless you you input something here, everything will be recorded on all of your model. So going back here, now we've talked about the recorder. Always put the recorder first, always rename your recorder. Afterwards, we have the load pattern. This is very straightforward. I'm just gonna, sorry, the constraint pattern. I'm not going to talk a lot about this. So constraint pattern, I told you last time, is just a construct in STKO that we use to keep consistency with OpenSea's naming system, uh, you have to add all of your constraints here, otherwise they will not be enforced in your model. And the same goes for the loads. As you can see for constraints, we only have two categories, single point and multipoint. But for the loads, we have many others, loads, elastic loads, um, prescribed displacement loads, generic loads. On the generic loads, there is just the surface load. You will have to input that there. It will not appear in any of the other vector editors in any of the other categories. And here, what else you have to put is your time series tag. So if your load has to be applied with a ramp, that ramp has to be selected here. If it has to be applied with a path, for example, um, a cyclic path, it has to be input here. And of course, you have um, here some a box you can click. You can input a factor. So if you are doing, for example, a load combination on a concrete structure and you want to do different combinations on it, and maybe once apply the load with a specific coefficient and another time, no, you can actually create different pattern, different load pattern and apply different factors and maybe add and remove them at different stages of the analysis so that you can um, at the end of your results have different stages and your stages will correspond to your combinations. We will try to do an example like this because I think it's very uh, useful for practical use. Anyway, when we get to the analysis command, we have to kind of refresh what we did in the first uh, week of this class. Um, 
what you find in the analysis command in STKO is everything plus a few things of the analysis command in um, in OpenSys. It's not called like this because it's made of a lot of different commands. So it, a lot of stuff of, that we will go really in detail in the next two weeks. But these are, let's say, let's say the six um, most important aspects of it. We have the constraint handler, the number, uh, the test, the algorithm, the integrator, and the solver. These are like six monsters that we have to tackle. So the constraint handlers tells you how the constraints will be handled inside the matrix of your model. So what will happen to the, your structure matrix when you're going to enforce the constraint on it? Will the lines will be erased? Will they be, will them be duplicated? What will happen? The numbers, it tells you how the DOFs of your structure will be numbered because now you see nodes uh, in your model, but of course each node has a specific number of DOF if you are in 2D or 2D or 3D, and all of these those DOFs are numbered. So it will mm, a different number will just define uh, different ways on how to assign an ID on ID to each of these nodes and each of these DOFs. Then we have a conversion test. It can be as in most FAM software, it can be on displacement on low on on force balance or on energy so we will discuss when to use each of these tests and why then we have a solution algorithm that will determine how you um, you move from one step to the other in the analysis most of you that studies fam at university will study different types of solution algorithms you don't need to know exactly how they work you just need to know how um, how they work in comparison with each other, what are their perks in terms of computational efficiency and accuracy of the results. Then uh, we have integrators. It's what iterates from the last time steps to the current time steps. So it's what, let's say, moves your analysis forward. And then we have the solver. So how is this, your solution is provided? I'm not, I, can, I cannot go into details on this today. And also maybe I need to prepare more too. So just like prepare your questions because I'm sure everybody has some on this. And we have a lot, actually a lot on the forums about it. When you open an analysis command, which is the last necessary step in the analysis steps to run your analysis, you have default setups, like default options already inputted in, inside here. So if you just open this, create it and click OK, you can run a static analysis, even with a nonlinear material, just like this as long as you applied loads and not prescribed displacements. Um, so apart from all the things I told you before, and of course the type of analysis, which we have two, static and dynamic, but apart from the constraint handler, the number, the system, the algorithm, the test on the convergence, the integrator and the analysis, no, sorry, and the integrator, sorry, we are here. Um, what we have extra, in the analysis command in STKO is the time step type. So if you're using a fixed time step or if you want STKO to use an adaptive time step and so iterate uh, over the same time steps to find the size of the step that is necessary to find convergence. So this will just make your analysis last longer but probably improve the probability of finding convergence. What happens here is that the duration of your analysis is divided by the number of increments that you applied. But if you choose the adaptive options, this number will be defined by, by OpenSeed, by some script that we, run, that we inputted inside of STKO that will actually uh, iterate over the time steps to find the, cor the correct one. So either smaller or larger. And then we talked this to, about this last week what's the load const. So this will keep the loads constant for the next analysis stage. And of course, if you click this, you have the possibility to reset the pseudo time, which is, as we discussed last week, the time in, in, uh, in OpenSys, which does not always have the concept of time, but sometimes just the analysis process. And at the end, we have the wipe analysis. So what does the wipe analysis command does? This is something you find in the OpenSys documentation. What it does is destroying all the analysis setup. So everything that you put here is destroyed. 
what is difficult to understand, and it's something that I did not really grasp at the beginning, is that whenever you set up an analysis and you run an analysis with a command like this inside, we're actually building your matrices in a specific way. It's not just the, the structure, um, the structure of problem is not built until you define all of these elements. And even if you don't want to run an analysis that's like, uh, that will proceed in time, for example, a gravity analysis or a pushover, but you just want to do an eigenvalue analysis, you still need to have a setup for it so that you know um, how all of your model is constructed inside of OpenSeas completely. And then at the end, like, let's say maybe you have to imagine all of these as, let's say, um, some like information on your model, not on your analysis only, but on your model itself. And then this is what would, ooh, sorry, this is what will make it proceed. If you just put zero and zero here, nothing will run, but the matrices of your model will be built in the way that you define here. Um, just remember, this setup will be wiped if you click on the wipe analysis. What can happen is that you want to make numerous analysis set up in different ways, one after the other. So wipe analysis can be a useful command then. But if your analysis setup does not change, you do not need to wipe after it. Instead, it will actually create you problem if you're using the analysis command to define, um, let's say this default uh, configuration that can be useful for running an again value analysis. If you do not input this information, but you run an again value analysis without anything inside, what will happen is that SDKO will call some default uh, information for the analysis type, the constraints, which are not the same ones that you see here. The defaults are, for example, dynamic, and they use transformation method, I think, as a default. Anyway, they're not really, mm, it's not really important that you know, because well, it's necessary that the user knows what he's doing, and knows what what is the default setup that they want to enforce on their model. Anyway, going forward, we have something extra because this was like say, the basic things that you can input in the analysis steps. But then we have all the missed commands that are available here when you create a new analysis step in the editor, you will be able there to see there's a, a, a group called missed commands. And on these commands, I'm gonna just talk to you about a few of them. The custom command is something that can help you interact directly with your SQL script, because whenever you go um, and run your analysis here, you can also just write your input file. We've seen this in the few, in the weeks before. When you write your, oh, sorry, we have to merge here, otherwise nothing will happen. When you run your input file in a folder, this happens. So. Um, these seven folder, the seven files are created. And for example, what is it that you put in your analysis steps? It's actually written in this file with some more stuff that we need in STKU to run our analysis. Okay. You will not be able to understand all of it, but for example, here we are enforcing our constraints. Here we have a lot, here we're applying our loads. And then we have many loads because we have many elements. We did a very fine mesh. And then when we go down, whoop. Yeah. When we go here, we are gonna find, this is our analysis command setup, the things we put in analysis command. And at the end, what we put at the end of it, okay? For example, you can see here we have to print, we asked to print the model properties of the file here in the model properties command. What if we add a custom command and we say puts, I am a custom command here. Oh, let's give it a meaningful name, method. And then we move it 
where we want it to be seen. And we write our input file again. Yes. So when we refresh, you will see that there's a tickle script message here, what we actually inputted as a custom command. So let's say this custom command just allows you to interact with your script without having to open it afterwards and edit it manually if you want to add or change something. Of course, if what you outputted is something that you have created beforehand through uh, one of the SDK commands, you cannot modify it through the custom command. But you can add, for example, last week there was someone asking how to source a time series file. You can do it through this command. You source your time series file, you create your load pattern directly through it, and you place it in the analysis steps at the point that you need it to be, that it needs to be placed. So before the analysis command setup, for example. Going forward, um, we have the monitor. We saw the monitor the week in week three, I think, just very briefly. Uh, I would just refresh a few things. The monitor is a very is a built-in tool of SDKO. It's to plot um, some of your results during the analysis. So as is as the analysis is running, this is very useful. I use it in all the analysis that I do because it's it allows you to see if things are actually going well or not. You can plot uh, some uh, uh, results against the time or results against each other. You need to specify the selection text on which you have to you want to extract the results and plot them. You have to assign a name to it most most often, and just do it because if you rename your curve and you have many of them, then you can see them differently in the in the plot. Uh, just remember that if you want to save the plot. Uh, you have to do it before you rerun your analysis, otherwise it would be erased and recreated. So if you want to save a previous plot, just copy paste it in another folder. Um, and finally, you can add a background plot by inputting X and Y axis. If you need to adjust your results from STKO, you can use a scale factor to get to the background plot scaling system. And this is very useful for comparison with experimental data. Finally, we have just another two um, custom commands, not custom commands, sorry, miscellaneous commands. Uh, we have the Riley command that is used to assign dumping to your structure. You have a documentation of OpenSeas here that explains to you, this is how the dumping matrix is, co is um, constructed. And there's an automatic building tool in STKO that just defines the dumping based on a few parameters that you can input, just maybe the percentage of dumping that you want. And the, the, um, the tester will just show you how uh, the dumping will be computed. And it assigns dumping to all previously defined elements and nodes in your structure. So if you want to run dynamic, this is the tools you need to use. And if you want to run, uh, to assign dumping just to a few elements of your structure, what you can use is your, the region command, which is another miscellaneous command, you need to define a selection set of geometries to which you want to apply dumping and then click on the Riley box here. Or you can use the region command to add and erase geometries in your structure. Or for example, if you want to extract a node list and then source it from a tickle script or from a custom command inside your analysis steps, for example, mm, it can be useful if you have a if you want to define a custom recorder on specific nodes, uh, but you don't know the ID of the nodes and you cannot read them because um, I mean tag, the, the 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 tags that the STKO creates they're not really super readable if your model is quite big. Then you can just uh, define a selection set, which is very easy. Select it there and then write on list and define the name of the output file on which you want to write the list of IDs of those geometries. And then uh, in a custom command, source that file from the folder in which you saved it. So I, I understand it's a bit complicated, but we will do examples on all of these aspects. So this is the basics of the mesh and analysis. I think I got a little bit over time, not so much, but we started a bit late. Um, if any of you guys has some questions, we can take some minutes for it. 
I see there's not many people today, but yeah. The fewer, the better. If no one else wants to start, I have four questions. Go for it. Uh, first, um, regarding the, the seeds of the mesh, when we, the, like two weeks ago, we speak about uh, the force beam element that we didn't need to um, make it like a small, small element. We could just use one. So everything I was doing now with this uh, element I was not adding extra seeds. Is that okay, or should I add seeds? So the the point with the force beam column element is that your solution is anyway good enough. You do not need to refine your mesh to obtain a good solution, because the it's not depending on that. Okay. Because what it like you remember the distinction what it does like okay it assumes uh, a, a field of forces in equilibrium and then. Uh, derives the, the deformation. So it, I, I remember that only if we were, uh, if the, the, yeah. the important thing is that if I'm using a displacement uh, beam element, then I have to make a refined yeah, mesh. That's but true. if not, I can I can work with these two points only and don't add extra seeds. Yeah, you can do that. And okay, so I won't have anything. But, but if you want, you can also refine your mesh. Okay. But for example, when, when we were using the surface load command, you remember? Which one? What if you use the surface load command on a yes. face? Yes. But but you don't want to apply a shell element on that face, but just the surface load command, then you need to assign a one a global seed, a global seed of one. So what happens is that if you assign if you use a displacement being column and a surface load. It doesn't really work because your face will be meshed to com compatibly with the edges. So it will create nodes inside of the face and they will not know how to behave because they have no element applied to it. So, this is why I had an error. Yeah. So I removed the surface low and I went to edge. <laughs> okay. This explains Wait, a lot. You could have just, uh, just used the force beam column and you didn't need to refine your mesh and just use the face as this so it has a one quadrilateral mesh element okay but so if i use a surface load the surface load i have to add the at the seeds no that's the opposite let's go back to the model of week three okay sorry no problem so if we run this like this i'm sure it will give us an error Okay, so it says minus three error flag. Yes, always that okay. minus three error minus flag. Minus three error flag, your model is singular. So this means all of these nodes here, we did not apply any element to this face. And this means that the, sol the, like the, the, the software does not know how to search the solution here, but we have nodes. So we need to create to search solutions everywhere. So this is kind of the, of, of, Kind of a finite element problem more than a modeling SDKO problem. And anytime you have a mesh node, that node has to belong to something that has a finite element formulation. And here, the face does not have any element, any finite element formulation. We only have beams. So this means that all the nodes has to belong to beams. So whenever here we're going to, if we reassign like a global seed of one and rebuild our mesh. You see that um, based on how we created the, um, the structure, uh, each of these faces has one element and that element knows how to behave because the nodes uh, belongs to beams and they have a finite element formulation applied. For example, here we had a problem. I didn't explain this last time. Here we had a problem because uh, there is the master node in the center. So if I make the master node belong to the face, then it will actually want to divide the face in two because to create a compatible mesh, all the nodes need to be com connected in a way. No? And so we actually added a line, but then if you go in the property, there is no physical property applied to this line. So this is just a mesh line, something that we enforced on the geometry 
to create the mesh that we wanted so that the two nodes belonged already to the to a final element formulation but you would you, you do not need to apply anything to it because it's not like uh, it's floating somewhere so it's connected to everything and you do not need to apply anything to it. it's just instrumental to create the geometry that you want okay then now i understand which well I, in the end i remove it and i went to edge low and then the the, the mesh ran perfectly sorry <laughs> the, the model ran perfectly and i was like why and now i realize that i, that I didn't do this okay this, i didn't i didn't make the, the distribution so okay now i understand what which was my error so my my second my second question is related to this like for example uh, if if we have the master node and then we say, okay, these four are my are the slave of this master node. Uh, well, I try to run it, and it says like the master node is not mesh. Did you mesh? So I, sh I just mesh, like yeah. I have I I just mesh and it ran. Okay. But then uh, the thing is the interaction. Uh -huh. I have to mesh it, or is mesh by itself? Because if you go to into conditions, you can see that there's there are like seeds. In the lines, it like um, yeah, but those, those those seeds are just uh, a, a representation of the application of the condition. So I'm gonna show you. But if I don't go, need to mesh the interaction then. No, when you mesh, uh, the interaction will be computed as part of the nodes of your structure. Like the the nodes will be uh, renumbered when you run your analysis and specific IDs will be given to the nodes of the mesh. And then those nodes will be connected to the interaction, but it's not that this line, for example, connecting uh, from here to the master node, it will be cut in three, because it's not like you're looking for results on this and there's no element formulation applied to this uh, line. This is just a representation of saying, you have to make this node move as a rigid body in reference to this node. So the, 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 the representation is just something to show you that uh, we have a condition applied to this interaction. If you go in condition, and where is the rigid diaphragm? You go here, and then you unassign by clicking ask, you will see that the balls disappear. Okay, so I don't have to mesh any of that when I just mesh the rest of the them yeah but whenever you mesh you mesh everything you created yeah. and Inclu including these points that are there but they are just points yeah but those points are not going to be meshed no 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 <laughs> okay no, no, but, but just remember if you create an interaction after you mesh you have to remesh let's remesh yeah always always remesh. um then regarding the uh well the simple simple question the monitor, uh, when I normally, well, I have one monitor. If I add a, an extra monitor, I will always see all of the all of the, the plots in the same the window. Yeah, so but I, then on the right, on the top right, you can uh, select from the drop down menu which one of the curves you want to see, or if you want if, to see them both. Oh, if I, if I want, let, let's say I'm, I'm monitoring a pushover in two different um, control nodes. So I can I can have both at the same time to see if there's any difference or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I can yeah. I can see both. So I have I just need to put one under the other in the in the analysis. Column. Yes, and call them in a different way. Yeah. Okay. okay. And regarding the wipe analysis, if I understood correctly, if I want to do like first one one horizontal, uh, let's say I have the vertical one and then an horizontal with one load and then an horizontal with another load. I may have to make like wipe analysis, so. No, no so you want, to, you want to wipe only if your analysis changes setup. If you are doing a setup, in, in setup I mean like the type, uh, the algorithm, the constraint handler, those things will not change if you're just doing a gravity and a pushover one after the other. You no, have but if, to, I, if I want to do two pushovers, different, different pushovers. Yeah, but different pushovers are just have just different load, but the analysis yes, setup is the same. the same. Yeah, so what you want to do is just to keep the setup 
because then it means that it has to renumber your model. And that's not really nice. <laughs> like you, you don't really need that. You need uh, the analysis to be kept the same. But for example, if you're doing a, a static analysis and then a dynamic analysis, and you don't want to keep the load constant in between, and you don't care about the, the fact that they interact with each other at all, but you want to do them on the same model because it's the same building, then you can wipe. Okay, so the recommendation is like for simple structures is to no, always no, wipe no, or no, never, never wipe. wipe. <laughs> okay, and, those, those and were my like questions. in open seas, it's wipe is kind of useful because if you don't put it at the end of your script until you close the open seas console, it will not input your results. Like you will not have your output files like a notes dot text where you uh, record the uh, the, uh, the nonce results. So just use the wipe. In, in OpenSys, uh, at the end of each analysis, we do use wipe, but in STKO, it will save anyway the results. OK. Thank you. Those were all my questions. OK, good. They were not four. They were three. Or they were four? No, no, four. OK. Four, four. But, but the interaction of force beam elements were like one connected okay. to the other. So guys, any more questions? Hi. Uh, yeah, actually I have one question, but it's somehow related to this presentation. I have a uh, script in open seas, but it's a like a very complicated model. So is it, is it possible to directly import my script in open seas to the uh, ST STKO. Yeah, is, it, is there any easiest procedure? Or should I have to bit by bit element material? Because I have like 40 part motions, the element is really complicated 3D model uh, for the IDA, IDA incremental dynamic analysis. So there any easiest way? Can I just import the the script directly? Uh, I have to do element by element, and then the ground motion as well. So unfortunately, you cannot import your pre-processing file in STKO. Like you you can't import your TICO script and then see your geometry appear in the preprocessor and then all the elements and materials and nodes be created automatically. What you can do is try to um, create little automations with custom script commands inside of the analysis command, for example, to source your 50 ground motions. You, you will be able to just copy paste uh, your script uh, in the custom command and then maybe run parts of your analysis directly on the geometry that you anyway have to recreate in STKO. But like, something really cool is that you can also save your results from your previous TICO script as it is with an MPCO recorder and that you can open okay. in STKO as a yeah, post-processing file. Yeah, I got it, okay. Alternatively, it's possible at each step I should I can copy paste because I already have the same script like in a form of text file, can I add, uh, copy at each stage, like copy paste, copy paste onto like the uh, and do with the whole like procedure? Is that I think that's going to work, right? So until here, like until the condition, you cannot copy paste. There's no custom oh. command in the rest of the thing. But what you can do is that here, all your analysis you can copy paste. I see. So, but for example, I don't know. Uh, if you want to record, um, let's say, results of specific nodes, then maybe in your TICO script, those nodes are called with, that, with an ID that you assign manually or through a, through a loop. Instead, here, the nodes will be renumbered by a STKO numberer. So, or anyway, so every the, time. The so, node ID is going, is going to change, right? Yes, the ID is going to change. Mm. Because That's the ID is issue. given based on the way you model. Mm, I Sorry, guys. I think that's all. So, like, I don't know if you want us to help you with your conversion, 
you can post a forum um, thread on our forum. You can just post your model. And maybe if you already made an attempt to create the geometry, post the model that you tried to create. No, actually, I haven't tried. But can you like uh, share the link for the thread so I can like uh, uh, join yeah. the thread? What? Okay, I'll be very glad to join the thread. That would be good. So, so just join the forum, and we'll try to give you some more tips on how to actually transfer your model from OpenSeas to SDKU. Right. That, okay. That would be great. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. So here we have a question in the chat. Uh, I have a solid body with a pile in the middle. I'd like to mesh in a way that meshes get, that the mesh gets finer as it gets closer to the pile. Uh, and it decreases left to right till the pile and then increases till the end of the soil. Okay, so you try to use bias by size. So that's the only tool we actually have to change the edge of the mesh, um, let's say proportionally. Let, let me try because I haven't used this in a long time, but I want to assign to this edge, let's say an edge seed bias by size. Size is 10 and it's biased by two. Let's see. Nothing really, yeah, what is happening? Okay. So I think here I have to assign Oh, I have to remove it before, otherwise we will not see the change. Let's try again, bias by size. Then 0 0.1. Whoop, sorry guys. So it's sh what should be happening is that it gets smaller closing in on one edge. And I think it is happening because here is smaller. But let's try on another example because I can't really see here. New, no. So let's see if I can help you directly or if we need to call in the master. To help us. Okay, so at seed, let's do bias by division. Ah, oh, yeah, that was like this because it was not bias by division. Okay, so I, I see. I think by size is a bit complicated because. Uh, you need to be very aware of the size of your model. I was not aware in the other model of the size. So what you can use this tool is for just like assigning uh, a bias to the distance in between the mesh, the nodes of the mesh. So there will be still like this amount of division or if you use the size and you know the size, the amount of size, and they will be biased in a specific direction. If you want to reverse the direction, it will be done towards the other node. So you just make a check in which direction is working in your model and then you try in the other direction. What, there was another part of your question that I don't remember now. Let me uh, see in the chat. Oh, I have a figure. Nice. Let's see this figure. Okay, so what you want to do is, so you don't like this, this mesh that you managed to create, uh, a good sun. You want the mesh to decrease left to right, left to right and then increase to the end of the soil body. So anyway, what you can do is this bias, you can just apply it to the edge, no? as we did now. 
So if you, for example, um, let me remove them. And let, let's just complete these. So you want the mesh is decreasing left to right till the pile and that increasing till the end of the soil body. So you need to have different edges uh, that you can assign the bias to. And then I'm going here, bias by division, just because it's easier for me. I reverse and I apply to piece. Okay. And then I take away the reverse and apply to this. And this is this is gonna happen like well, let's assign this to all of the um, bias by division. Then 0.1. So you, you, I don't know if you need to use union or merge. It depends on what you want to achieve with your solid, because you're asking how to do that. But of course, you need different edges. So the edges need to be separated. Otherwise, you cannot apply different seeds. For example, let's remove this and do it properly. So your bias by division has to go from here to the center. Reverse. No, we did it wrong. So let's bias by division. Then zero point one. Let's not reverse this time. Exactly. And then let's reverse uh, sign here. Exactly. And then, for example, you can apply. Uh, Uniform by division to the rest. Of course, we did not create a face, so this will not really work. You will not see what you want to see. So yeah, so we still have these seeds. Let's see what happens. I'm not sure, to be honest. Yeah. Let's assign a structured quadrilateral element if it manages to build them. already assigned. Let's erase the previous mesh and remesh. Yeah, okay, so like this you see you have increasingly small elements towards the center. Not sure if this is what you wanted, uh, but I guess so. So let's looking at your image. Mm. If you want also the, the, the edges here to be small, like you don't want your mesh to converge in the center, but you want the mesh here to be small too, you can apply um, the bias by size or by division, even to the, let's say, perimeter edges of your structure, not just the middle one. Okay, sorry, I will stop. I was just curious myself because I haven't used the bias by size, so not much. <laughs> Um, any more questions, guys? So, if you have anything you want to ask us, please do use our forum. You will see the recording and the material by tomorrow on our website. And thank you for participating, you all. We'll see. We'll meet again next week. Oh, we have someone. Oh, yeah, Larissa is saying bye. I love to say goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening, date, anything. And um, see you next week. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks.
Bye. Bye, Faisal.